السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الله الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه الطيبين الطاهرين We ask Allah تبارك وتعالى to grant us all the sincere intentions أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمد رسول الله الله How does everybody feel? How does everybody feel? Rosia, <laughs> thank you. Okay. You should be okay now. It's like 15 minutes before where uh, now you should be settled. The waters have calmed. MashaAllah. Khair. Let's, let's uh, renew our intentions again. For the sake of Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. So this was the, the eighth, eighth fast today? Eight, MashaAllah. Look, already almost ten days gone. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. MashaAllah. So, uh, a quick question. Whose uh, biographies have we been through? Uh, the brief biographies so far. Yes, Lady Aisha radiallahu anha. Can you tell me something about her that was mentioned? So, did you say she was the wife of the Prophet? Alayhi salatu wasalam. Come on. You know I want something. Okay, what else? One more thing. The daughter of Abu Bakr, he said, radiallahu anhuma. Is that Karim I help you? No? But that's good. That's good that you got that much, mashallah. Yes, she was the only virgin wife of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. She wasn't married before. Very good. Who else did we mention? Come on. How old are you, Faris? Faris, how old are you? He's 11. What do you remember? First with the Mushia. I, I can see you, but I, I just like to ask that. Where is Brother Nasser? Brother Nasser, sitting on the same row? MashaAllah. Do you remember? Ibn Malik, who was Ibn Malik? Sorry? Yeah, who was, what was his first name? No. We did mention Imam Ahmed, to be honest. Yeah. We mentioned his mother, yeah. What was her name? Do you remember? Sophia. We mentioned Anas. 
Anas ibn Malik radiyallahu anhu. Continuing in the book Riyadh al-Salihin with the sixth hadith. I'm sorry, with the fifth hadith. عن أبي يزيد مع ابن يزيد بن الأخنس رضي الله عنهم. Here we have Yazid. Sorry, we have Ma'an. Ma'an. Someone called Ma'an. We have someone called Yazid, and we have someone called Al Akhnas. وهو وأبوه وجده صحابيون. Ma'an, Yazid, and Al-Akhnas, they were all Sahaba. Uh, Ma'an was the son. His father, Yazid, and then his father, Ay Ma'an's grandfather, all these three generations, they were companions of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. It's said that all of them took part in the battle, uh, in the battle of Badr. But there is a difference of opinion. He said, so Ma'an said, Ma'an here is the son, and Yazid here is the father. Ma'an said, Kana Abi Yazid akhraja dananir yatasaddaqu biha. My father, whose name was Yazid, he had taken out some money and he, uh, so he taken aside some money so that he could donate that money. فَوَضَعَهَا عِنْدَ رَجُلٍ فِي الْمَسْجِدِ So he went to Al-Masjid Al-Nabawi and he put it in the masjid. He gave, that, he gave that money to a person, he appointed him and said to him, if anyone who is worthy of this money, who, anybody who is a faqir or a miskin, someone who's poor. If they come, then I appoint you to give them that money. I authorize you to give them that money if they meet that criteria. So, Ma'an, the son of Yazid, said, Fajitu fa'akhadtuha. I came and I, uh, I went and I took this money. فَأَتَيْتُهُ بِهَا I came and I, I, I went to my, I took the money that my father had put in the masjid and I took it to my father and I said, oh, I, I've taken the money because I'm deserving, because I'm poor. فَقَالْ He said, so my father said, وَاللَّهِ مَا إِيَّاكَ أَرَدْتُ وَاللَّهِ I didn't intend you. I didn't intend that you would take the money. My intention was not that you would be the one to take the money. And what he meant by that was that, or what is felt, the narrators say, that his father felt that giving to someone who was not related was better than giving to someone who was related. Otherwise, he would have just given it to his son. Or perhaps he didn't know that his son was in need. So he intended for... Anybody who is eligible amongst the poor Muslims to take that money. That's why he separated it from his money and took it to the masjid, gave it to that man, authorized him to give it to anybody who was poor. Little did he know that his son turned up to the masjid that day and he said, he would have said something like, oh, what's this money? Uh, and the man said, well, if you're in need, you can take it. So he took it because he was eligible. Then he found out that it was his own father who put the money there. His father, he, he wouldn't have known that my son is poor. So the son said, فَخَاصَمْتُهُ So I took the matter to the Messenger of Allah. فَخَاصَمْتُهُ إِلَىٰ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ As though he's saying that I, the son, I was in need but my father didn't give to me. Or that my father is saying, why did you take it? 
It wasn't intended for you. So it, it, it was a bit of a, there was conflict in the situation. So they raised the matter to the, to the best of men. They raised the matter to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he said, Laka ma nawaita ya Yazid. Like, don't worry, Yazid. Because of what you intended, right, you still get the reward. Because Yazid, the father, was worried. Do I still get the reward? Because I didn't intend my son. Do I still get the reward? So the Prophet والسلام, said, Laka ma nawaita ya Yazid. You have what you intended. Wa innama li kulli mri'in ma nawa. As we mentioned in the first hadith. You will have what you intended. So the Prophet والسلام, reassured him that don't worry, you have what you intended. You have the reward. Even if you didn't intend to give it to your son, he's eligible, he took it, you still have the reward. So he, he was uh, satisfied. Then he said, As for what you took, O Ma'an, who is the son, you can keep that. Religiously, you're allowed to keep that. And in this situation, the scholars said that if it is a gift that the father or the parent, if the parent gives a gift to the son or to the child, then the parent can return. Meaning the parent can say, give it back. Parent can say that. And this is a special case. Otherwise, if the person was not a parent, if it was between two friends, somebody gifted someone something. They gifted someone this pen. It was a gift. They said, this is yours. So that person took it. In this situation, this person, he cannot take it. By counseling, you know, I'll my give back. Once you've given it already, the Prophet والسلام, mentioned الذي يعود في هبته, the one that goes back on their gift, asks for it back, uh, is like, he compared it to the dog that vomits and then licks up its own vomit. He said, إلا, he mentioned in the narration, إلا والد, except for a parent. A parent can give a gift and then take it back. There are other hadiths that are connected to this. That actual part about the gifting is not here. As for donating, then a person cannot go back on his donation. Here, the father had intended to donate and not to gift. There is a difference. So here, the main point that is being made is the intention. That the intention is what counts here. In the next hadith, Al-Hafidh al nawawi said, this is hadith number six in this chapter. وَعَنْ أَبِي إِسْحَاقِ سَعَدْ إِبْنِ أَبِي وَقَاسِ Have you heard of Sa'ad before? Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. You can nod if you have. Yes? Okay. Right, so you heard of Sa'ad. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. Haven't you done the seerah? Al-Ashar Mubashirun. You, you too? Al-Ashar Mubashirun. Fil Jannah. Yeah? So, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, radiyallahu anhu, he was one of the companions, he is the narrator of the next hadith. And he was one of the ten that were granted paradise. In one session, the Prophet والسلام, said, Abu Bakr in Fil Jannah, Wa Umar Fil Jannah, Wa Uthman Fil Jannah, Wa Ali in Fil Jannah, Wa Sa'id, Wa Sa'id, Wa Abu Ubaidah. He mentioned like this ten people. And he said about them that they are in paradise. And these are known in our tradition, okay, in, in the Sunni tradition. As, uh, as Muslims, we know these people to be Al-Asharatul Mubasharun. This is the title they are given. Al-Ashara Al-Mubasharun. Or variants of that name. Ashara Mubashara, I think we say. 
Ashram Basharam. So uh, the ten that were Mubashar, meaning they were granted the good news of paradise in this life, in one sitting. This happened all in one go. So he is one of these people. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiyallahu anhu He He said that وَلَقَدْ أَتَى عَلَيَّ يَوْمٌ وَإِنِّي لَثَالِثُ الْإِسْلَامِ He said لَقَدْ أَسْلَمْتُ يَوْمَ أَسْلَمْتُ وَمَا فَرَضَ اللَّهُ الصَّلَوَاتِ He said that I was, as far as he knows, the third person to embrace that Islam. Early on. Early, very, 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 very early on. He embraced al Islam. So he would be amongst what is known as as sabiqun al awwalun Those that first embraced al Islam. And they have a higher status than some of the companions that came afterwards. Some of the companions that, that attained the rank of being a companion or this title of being a companion very late. So he said, لَقَدْ أَسْلَمْتُ يَوْمَ أَسْلَمْتُ وَمَا فَرَضَ اللَّهُ الصَّلَوَاتِ that I embraced Islam when I did, and the prayers had not yet been made obligatory. He said, wa aslamtu wa ana ibnu sab'a ashrata sana. I embraced Al Islam when I was seventeen years of age. Seventeen years of age. A lot of the companions, radiyallahu anhum, embraced Al Islam at a very young age, without their parents' permission, or not that they needed it, but without their parents knowing sometimes, and sometimes with their parents knowing. But these were very sensible, very like-minded, very intelligent, sharp youngsters. So Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiyallahu anhu embraced al-Islam at the age of 17. He also said, and this is known, he said, أَنَا أَوَّلُ مَنْ رَمَى فِي الْإِسْلَامِ بِسَهَمْ I was the first person to fire an arrow as a Muslim against an enemy in the nation of Prophet Muhammad So in war, he was the first one and, and he used to tell people that because this made him happy. He said, as Al-Bukhari al -Bukhari narrated, إِنِّي لَأَوَّلُ الْعَرَبِ رَمَا بِسَهْمٍ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ I, I was the first of the Arabs that fired an arrow for the sake of Allah in war. And he described one of the situations in battle. He said, وَرَأَيْتُنَا نَغْزُ He said, one time we were in a battle. وَمَا لَنَا طَعَامٌ إِلَّا وَرَقُ الْحُبْلَةِ we were in a battle, or we were going towards a battle, or we were somewhere where either we were, um, we were camping, ready for a battle, or, or, or it was after the battle, or we were marching somewhere. He said, we didn't have anything to eat except leaves, the leaves of the trees. That's what we would feed on. He said, وَإِنَّ أَحَدَنَا لَيَضَعُ كَمَا تَضَعُ الشَّاهِ he said that the situation was such that you could take many lessons from this. He said that we used to eat leaves and such that if one of us went to the bathroom, what we would see is, if, if we defecated, what we would see is excrement like the excrement of sheep or goats. If you know, it's, it's rounded. It's like small little... Circles, like Maltesers, not to put up Maltesers, but mashallah. Like that. So it tells you that they ate what they could find. Their bodies changed out of sacrifice for the sake of Allah, wa ta'ala. They did what they had to do. 
It's not like they were going into battle and someone said, okay, who wants a shawarma? How many of you want uh, you know, lahmah? Who wants dajaj kabir? Who wants, uh, who wants extra salad? Okay. Then a man went off and brought 500 sandwiches. It wasn't like that. They, they ate whatever they could find. In one of the battles, the companions, they had to walk across an arid land. And it was such that their feet became affected. Their nails started to come out from their feet. Their nails started to come out. So they had to wrap, uh, they had to take off their shirts and other things. And they had to wrap their feet and then walk. This is called the Battle of Dhat al that riqa means the one with the patches around the feet. So the companions went through a lot. They went through a lot. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiyallahu anhu Sayyiduna Ali radiyallahu anhu said about him ma sami'tu Rasulallahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yafdi ahadan bi abawayhi illa sa'dan he said, I have never heard Sayyiduna Ali radiyallahu anhu said, I had, have never heard the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam sacrifice in, in, in verbally both his parents for someone. Like we say, Ya Rasulallah uh, bi abi wa ummi may, may my mother and my father be sacrificed for you. Because he is the most beloved to us alayhi salatu wasalam. But Sayyiduna Ali radiyallahu anhu said, I never heard the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam himself say about his mother and his father together that may they both be sacrificed for someone other than Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. He said, Sami'tuhu yaqulu yawma Uhud. Yawma Uhud. On the, the battle of Uhud. When Sa'ad radiyallahu anhu was firing arrows and protecting the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam to encourage him, said to him, Irmi Sa'ad, fidaka abi wa ummi. Fire, O oh Sa'ad. May my mother and my father be sacrificed for you. This is a term that expresses great endearment. It shows how much you love that person. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiyallahu anhu was someone for whom the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made dua. And he said, Allahumma stajib lahu idha da'aka. Ya Allah, if Sa'ad asks you, give him. Allahumma stajib lahu idha da'aka. If he makes dua, then give him, grant him what he has asked for. And this was known about him, that he was among the people whose dua was answered. On one occasion, after the Prophet ﷺ passed away, there was a person, as is narrated, there was a person who was insulting our master Ali radiyallahu anhu. He was sitting on a horse and he was insulting our master Ali radiyallahu anhu. So Sa'ad radiyallahu anhu got up and said, Ala ta'lamu annahu awwalu man aslam? Don't you know that he was the first one to embrace al Islam, meaning from the children? Ala ta'lamu annahu awwalu man salla ma'a Rasulillah? Don't you know that Ali was the first one to pray alongside the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam because Sayyidina Ali lived in the Prophet's house. When the Prophet was 40 years old alayhi salatu wasalam, uh, Sayyidina Ali radiyallahu anhu was 10. So he was born when the Prophet was 30 alayhi salatu wasalam. And when and, and because Abu Talib had cared for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when the Prophet himself was younger, the Prophet returned the favor to Abu Talib by caring for his son, Sayyidina Ali radiyallahu anhu.
So Sa'ad said, don't you know that he's the first one that embraced that Islam? Oh you, ya hadha. Oh you who is insulting him. Don't you know that he was the first one who prayed alongside the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? And then he kept saying statements like this. Don't you know this? Don't you know that? Don't you know that? How dare you swear at him? Until he said, Alam ta'lam annahu khatanu rasulillah? Don't you know that he is the son-in-law of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? This man who was insulting Sayyiduna Ali radiyallahu anhu was from Bani Umayyah. Banu Umayyah, the Umayyads, if you will, it was common amongst them that they would insult Sayyiduna Ali radiyallahu anhu. There was a period of time where they were made, it was, it was mandatory for them to insult Sayyiduna Ali radiyallahu anhu on the minbar every Jumu'ah. Until Sayyiduna Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, who we mentioned in the past, who met Al Khadir uh, salam, he came and he was from Banu Umayyah also, but he changed things around. He changed the insult that, they, that people would give, that the Khutaba, the, the ones who delivered the sermon, would say about Sayyiduna Ali. He changed that statement with, Man yahdihi Allahu fala mudillala, wa man yudlilhu fala. So he was the one that introduced that statement into the khutbahs and he replaced the insult that they used to have for Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu anhu. This goes back to the battles that occurred and Banu Umayyah, they took the caliphate and so on and so forth. But this man was insulting Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu anhu and so Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas started to remind him, don't you know that he is the one who this and this and this and the Prophet والسلام, gave our master Ali radiallahu anhu the banner in such, such and such war and so on. But that man, it seemed like he didn't flinch. He was insulting Sayyiduna Ali. So then Sa'ad, he lifted his hands and he faced the Qibla. He knew the Prophet made dua for him. He faced the Qibla, he raised his hands and he said, Allahumma, Ya Allah, Inna hatha, indeed this person, Yashtumu waliyan min awliya'ik. He is insulting a wali, a very pious slave, from among your pious slaves. Fala tufarriq hatha al-jam'a. Ya Allah, do not let this gathering of people disperse until you show them a great sign of your power. Suddenly, as soon as he said that, and he was mujabud du'a, mujabud da'wa, as soon as he said that, the horse that this person was on, its front legs gave way. Its front legs gave way or became studded in the earth. They dropped. And so that man, he fell suddenly off the horse. He banged his head and he died. The Prophet والسلام, said, Allah revealed, Man li waliyan faqad bil harb. Whoever takes a wali, of, of Allah, Allah revealed, whoever takes a wali of mine as an enemy, then, if you want to be literal, then war will be waged on this person. Allah revealed in this hadith could see, then I am informing this person that this person, it's like war, war will be waged on him. Meaning this is a person who is insulting uh, a pious person. This person will see the consequences of that. This person, he hit his head on a, a rock and he died instantly. Another time, there was a person...
who was speaking out, saying that uh, he, he became a caliph. And he said to the people, we will do with the treasury of the Muslims, the money of the Muslims, whatever we want. Meaning he was, he was insinuating, he was, he was saying that we can use it however we want, meaning even the things that we should use it for, we're not going to use it for. And that, like to say, who's going to stop us? So then, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, radiyallahu anhu, he was in the gathering. So he stood up and he put up his hands. The man had come off, come off the pulpit where he gave the speech. So Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, radiyallahu anhu, stood up and he raised his hands. That man saw him and he ran back up onto the podium. He said, no, 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 no. I am. <laughs> he knew. He knew Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, radiyallahu anhu, his dua is mustajab. He said, no, no, I, I take that back. This is the money of Allah. This is the wealth of Allah. And we will use it correctly. So Sa'ad, radiyallahu anhu, was a very pious person whose dua was answered. Uh, the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentioned in a hadith that a person who asks Allah to forgive the Muslims every day by saying, for example, رَبِّ اغْفِرْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ رَبِّ اغْفِرْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ say, say after me for the sake of Allah رَبِّ اغْفِرْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ Again, رَبِّ اغْفِرْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ So this means, O oh Allah, I ask you to forgive all of the male and female Muslims some of their sins. So from the time of Adam alayhi salam until now all the Muslims that have lived among the humans and among the jinn all of them Ya Allah I ask you to forgive all every single one of them some of their sins. And also, you could say that it means, Oh Allah, forgive. Uh, no, it's the same thing. That a person would say this statement, Rabbi ghfir lil mu'minina wal mu'minat, and it means, Oh Allah, forgive all of the Muslims some of their sins, and some of the Muslims, forgive them all of their sins. That's what this statement means together. O oh Allah, forgive all of the Muslims some of their sins. And as for some of the Muslims, Ya Allah, forgive them all of their sins. This is what it means when you say once, Rabbi ghfir, O oh Allah, forgive, lil mu'mineen, for the male Muslims, wal mu'minat, and the female Muslimas, Muslimat. And he said, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that a person, if they say this once, this is a different hadith now. If they say this once, then they get one reward for every Muslim that they may dua for. So that's Adam alayhi salam, Sheith alayhi salam, Idris, Nuh. And you could continue like this. And then every single Muslim. So what is the number of Muslims that have been and have lived and are alive now from the men and the women, the humans and the jinn? A person would get a reward for each one of those people. So, and he said, alayhi salatu wasalam, going back to the first hadith, if a person says every day 27 times, Rabbi ghfir lil mu'minina wal mu'minat, and they say this for a while. How long is a while? The Prophet didn't mention alayhi salatu wasalam. But if a person says it for a while, every day, so without any cuts, without any days off, uh, then they would become somebody whose dua is answered. They would become somebody whose dua is answered. I'll tell you a little story. Something that happened to me. I 
used to, it's not, I mean, mashallah, it's not uh, a long story, but I used to, um, I sometimes, when I walk, I take a path. I, I take a route, uh, yeah, I take a route to come here, I take a route even, to come here. And whenever I'm there, I, I would say, Rabbi ghfir lil mu'mineen wal mu'minat. By the time I get here, I've said it more than 27 times. So I had a you know, streak of quite a few days for, I, mean, I don't know, maybe even a month. Then, because I was used to saying it, whenever I would go on that path, I'd remember. Because context-wise, I saw a particular lamppost, for example, and I remember, oh yeah, I've got to say, Rabbi ghfir lil mu'mineen wal mu'minat. Okay? Then one day, I did a complete blender. Guess what happened? I didn't see that lamppost. So I didn't remember to say, Rabbi ghfir lil mu'mineen wal mu'minat. Just like that, the day went. So from the hadith, so, so that day went without me saying it. So, subhanallah al -Azim. That merit, that would, yani, as the Prophet mentioned, alayhi salatu was salam, perhaps, because he said every day. I didn't get to say it every day, so what can you expect? This is to tell you that uh, you need to be very, very, very aware of the adhkar that you do and the times that you do them at, but try to make them, uh, try, try not to make them dependent on a particular context. Because uh, imagine you recite Surah Al Waqi'ah after Al Maghrib. Then, if you follow the Shafi'i school, let's say one day you're traveling and you delay Al Maghrib to Al Isha and you don't recite Al Waqi'ah. For example, okay? Um, so, one of my friends, he, he's Tunisian, he said, uh, he, he called me once up while I was still in the university in Lebanon and he said to me, don't, one of the things that you should take care of when you leave Lebanon, because you're always there with, with the brothers and you recite after Al Aisha and you know, there's a routine, but don't forget your adhkar, your, the, 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 the dhikrs that you say, don't forget them. Okay, be steadfast on them. Recite every day after the prayers, recite Ayatul Kursi after the prayer, don't forget these things. So, yeah, and it's good to get into a routine, but then also be very, very, very aware also, vigilant even. Monitor yourself when y your situation changes slightly. You don't want to lose out. So this is something that everybody should do. The Prophet wasalam, said that if you say this 27 times a day, then this person would become somebody whose dua is answered. And who doesn't want their dua to be answered? You would, you would, of course, you would much prefer just to ask Allah. Why ask this person and that person? Just raise your hands and ask Allah and you're given, right? So this is one way, and, and Shaykh Abdullah said, this is a, a magnificent hadith. What a hadith. What a thing. He picked out, radiyallahu anhu, some hadiths amongst the pool of hundreds of thousands even of hadiths that he was aware of. And he picked out some of them that w had great merits in them. Like saying after the Maghrib and the Fajr prayer, La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah. Lahu al-mulku wa lahu al-hamdu yuhyi wa yumitu wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. Ten times before moving your foot, but staying in the praying position. If you say that, then you're protected. Uh, you're, you're, you're given ten uh, great rewards. You're, you're forgiven of ten major sins. You're protected from magic, being afflicted with magic, and protected from anything that would harm you until Al Fajr. And then from Al Fajr to Al Maghrib, if you said it like that. So that was one, and this is another one. So why should we, why would a person neglect saying this 27 times? I was told that even if a person doesn't say 27 times, and they, they didn't count, but they went over 27, then still that's fine. Still a person would be 
included in that. The Prophet ﷺ said that a person would become mujabad dua, mujab ad da'wah. He said the person would become mujab ad da'wah, which means that a person's dua would be answered. So this is something that is important. So in this hadith, the summary of this hadith is as follows. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiyallahu anhu, he narrates that after the hajj, the farewell hajj of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in which Sa'ad himself was with the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam, Sa'ad became very ill. And he thought that he was going to die from this illness. And he was in Al Hajj, so where was he? He was in which city? He was in Mecca, right? And he thought he was going to die. Now he was originally from Mecca. And the people that migrated, so Al Muhajirun, that migrated from Mecca to Al Medina, they didn't want to die in Mecca. Why? Because they have left Mecca, they've turned that leaf, they've started a new life in al Madina. They don't want to go back. They want to be seen as, not with insincerity, but they want to be seen as the people who supported the Messenger of Allah. The Prophet said, come, go to al Madina," and they left everything and they did. So they turned this new leaf. I mean, forget that. They, they opened a new book of their lives, right? So they didn't want to die in Mecca. They wanted to die in Al Medina. So he became ill in Mecca. And he didn't want to die in the place that he emigrated from. He left Mecca for Al Medina. So he told the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when the Prophet visited him. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I do not have many children except that I have one young daughter and I have a lot of money. So I want to, in my will, give this money to the Muslims, for the, Mus for the Muslims, uh, the cause to spread the da'wah. So, The summary of it is that the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam, he said, uh, if you must, then give a third of your wealth. At that time, give a third of your wealth. And like this, he and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went back and forth speaking like this. And he wanted to be among the people that doesn't die in Mecca, but dies away from Mecca. He wanted to be one of the people who uh, goes out fighting for the sake of Allah in the faraway lands and so on. So the Prophet ﷺ told him that you will not die as a result of this illness. And he told him that you will benefit many people yet. Many nations you will benefit. And then in the end of this hadith, the Prophet والسلام, he mentioned, while being saddened, he mentioned one of the companions, Sa'd ibn Khawla. And he mentioned that Sa'ad ibn Khawla, he wanted what Sa'ad wanted. But, and he had come from Mecca. He migrated from Mecca to al Medina, <coughs> But then he died in Mecca. He died in the place that he migrated away from. And he didn't want to die there. For similar reasons uh, as to what Sa'ad had said. So we're going to read this hadith now and you will see some of the details within it. 
So he said, جَاءَنِي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ يَعُودُنِي The Messenger of Allah صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ visited me. And this was from the uh, humbleness of the Prophet صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ that he would visit his companions and he would ask about them. Once the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam noticed that a companion who usually prays behind him isn't in the masjid. He hasn't come. So he asked, where is he? So they said, O Messenger of Allah, he's not well. So he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, let's go visit him. So they said, O Messenger of Allah, he, he lives really far away. So the Prophet والسلام, said, He comes from there to visit us, doesn't he? Doesn't he come every day? So there should be no problem for us to go there. So he would encourage his companions like this to ask about each other. And this showed his humbleness, that he was willing always to go to different parts of al Madina. The companions, they say that sometimes we, we would find the Prophet والسلام, in different places in al Madina. And al Madina is really big. Uh, especially if you're going by foot, sometimes uh, from the center, from Al-Masjid the Nabawi, there might be three or four kilometers that a person walks. So they would find the Prophet wasallam in different places within al Madinah, visiting those people and visiting those people. So Sa'ad said that he came to me in the year of Hajjat al Wada. In the year where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made the farewell hajj, his final hajj. He said, Min shiddati, min, min waja'in ishtadda bi. He said that he visited me because I was, uh, I was in severe pain, such that I thought I was going to die. He said in a narration, it's narrated from him that he said that I, I felt like I was going to die. فَقُلْتُ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ إِنِّي قَدْ بَلَغَ بِي مِنَ الْوَجَعِ مَا تَرَى You can see, O oh Messenger of Allah, the, the pain that I am in. This is how far my situation has reached. And the Prophet ﷺ didn't reprimand him, which tells us that it's permissible for a person to say that. It's not considered like, oh, stop complaining, you baby. No, we wouldn't say that to this person. Okay, a person can say that. They can say, look, I, I feel pain. There's no problem in that. I mean, to this uh, precision, okay, the scholars, they looked at the way the Prophet interacted with people. Like, for example, if someone said something and he didn't say anything, that means that thing's not haram. Right? So, so to this extent, they dissected the hadiths and looked at them from different, different angles. So, he said, uh, Ya Rasulullah, Inni qad balagha bi min al wajah ma tara. You see the pain that I'm in. Wa ana dhu mal. I have a lot of money. The scholars said here, in those times they spoke about, these times are very different. In those times, they, the, the scholars mentioned that in this there is proof that a person can gather money for a good purpose, for a religiously good purpose. Now, our times are very different because the scholars mention, and all four schools agree with this, that a person who is considered Islamically wealthy, or let's call them the rich people, al aghniya these people, they they are obligated to fulfill the needs of the Muslims. So what are the needs of the Muslims? They call them ad-darurat. Okay? The needs. This includes building schools. If, if uh, this is the way that they can teach children, for example, or building centers, if that is the best way to propagate the religious knowledge, uh, preparing people to learn the religious knowledge, to come, to go and come back, to become teachers, 
to feed every poor Muslim, to shelter every poor Muslim in the world, to clothe every poor Muslim. These are the necessities. They said if these are not fulfilled, and at times in the past, these were considered fulfilled. In the time of Sayyidina Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, radiyallahu anhu, people couldn't find people to give zakah to. Because they were like, oh, I don't need it. I don't need it. I'm not poor. I'm not poor. You couldn't find a person to give zakah to. But the people who are considered to be rich among the Muslims, it is an obligation upon them to fulfill the needs of the Muslims, especially at a time in which there is no Muslim treasury. There's no caliphate, it's been dissolved by the Western powers. And likewise, now there is no centralized system of, or, or rather uh, centralized wealth, which would be taken from to take care of the Muslims' needs. So now the obligation is upon the rich people. Such that the scholars mentioned that if there was a Khalifa and the Muslims' needs were not being met, these dire necessities were not being fulfilled, or dire necessities rather existed, like they do now, they said by force the Khalifa he would take from the rich, even if they didn't want to give, and it wouldn't be considered stealing. He would by force take their money and leave them what is enough for one year. So if they had a business or businesses, if they had assets and so on, then he would leave them with what they would need to survive for one year. And then their money would grow. But the rest, the savings he would take, and he would distribute it to fill, fill the Muslims' needs. So, especially nowadays, with the situation that we are in, spending lavishly and for the rich people, like for example, the Muslim millionaires, as an example. But it's not limited to them. It's not limited to them. Shaykh Abdullah said that if the rich Muslims nowadays think that by just by paying zakah they are safe from sin, then they are deluded. He said they are deluded. So he had a lot of money. And he said Despite me having all this money, لا يرثني إلا ابنة لي. No one will inherit from me except for my young daughter, and her name was Aisha, رضي الله عنها. And at that time, he did not have any other children. Uh, after that, Allah granted him more children after this, and. This Aisha radiyallahu anha became a scholar. And it said that Imam Malik narrated from her. He said, Ya Rasulullah, so I want to give. He said, Fa'atasaddaqa bi thuluthay mali. O Messenger of Allah. I want to give, I want to write in my will that I want to give away two-thirds of all of my wealth. And the religious rule here is that if a person writes in their will before they die, if they are on their deathbed, if they write in their will that I want to give away two-thirds of my wealth, this is not valid. It's not valid. So anything that is more than a third, except if the inheritors accept. 
So he said that to the Prophet I want to give two thirds of my money away. The Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said, la. He said, qala la. Qultu fashatr. Then what about half, O Messenger of Allah? Qala la. He said, la. He said, no. He said, qultu fathuluf. What about a third, O Messenger of Allah? Qala athuluf. Wa thuluthu kathir. And a third, the Messenger of Allah said, yes, a third, okay. But even a third is a lot. But this means that it's permissible. He said, a third you can, but a third is considered still a lot. And then the hadith continues, inshallah ta'ala. We will continue this hadith tomorrow. And, but today we will stop here, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, let's say, la ilaha illallah and as salah ala nabi. La ilaha illallah. اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم. Let's recite the Fatiha for the sake of Allah, like we do, and send the reward to the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام and Sheikh Abdullah, and to ask for the situation of the Muslims to be eased, for the Muslims to be relieved of their hardships. Remember, whenever you get a chance in this blessed month, make du'a. You do not know when your du'a may be answered. So regularly make du'a. And it doesn't mean that if you make du'a now and it's answered, then that you can't make a du'a 15 minutes later and it will be answered. And it, 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 there's no, uh, there isn't a, a limited amount of times you can make du'a and then you know, that's one strike if it's answered. And then, no, you can keep making dua, keep making, keep making. And you can be given and given and given and given and given. But don't stop making dua. Anytime that you find yourself with some free time, even if it's like I say sometimes, you're walking to the car. Say, la ilaha illallah for the sake of Allah. Say, astaghfirullah. These three, la ilaha illallah and astaghfirullah or rabbi ghfirli. And as salah ala nabi they are given a lot of importance. So you might spread them out through your day. You might have from the morning, you might have from 8 a.m. to, to uh, lunchtime. You might say, I'm going to do la ilaha illallah. Whenever I get free time, la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah. Even if you don't count it. Then you might say, okay, from al-dhuhr to al-asr, it's going to be astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. And then from al-asr, let's say, from after al-asr, to al-isha, it could be as-salah ala al-nabi. And then in the night, you can do whichever one you uh, wish. But I would say, do as-salah ala al-nabi in the night. Do as-salah ala al-nabi in the night. This month is very blessed. Wallahu kareem. Allah gives and gives and gives and gives and gives. Don't lose hope. Barakallahu <coughs> bikum. We'll stop here.